Hi everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our first advanced program webinar of the year. My name is Katie Briggs and I'm your webinar host. This webinar is part one of a seven part series taking place this year. Go to our website at publicmediawomeninleadership.org after today's webinar to view this year's webinar schedule. During today's session, we'll allow for audience questions. Please be sure to use the Q&A function within the webinar platform to ask a question to our panelists and we'll do our best to get to everybody's questions. So now for the main event. Today, our panel will share their candid stories, uh, strategies and tactics to help you learn how to best network in your community and beyond. I'm very happy to welcome our moderator, Veronica Varela Reyes, PMWL's own mentorship and engagement coordinator. Veronica, take it away. Thanks, Katie. Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I'm, exciting to join, I'm excited to join you in this conversation. During today's session, we will dive into the candid stories of our panelists, but before we do so, let's start by looking at six networking tactics as shared by Forbes that are going to help you thrive during your next networking event. The first one is, listen. Before joining a conversation, listen to what the topic is. Any remarks that catch your attention and assess what you can do, what you can do or add to the conversation. When jumping into a conversation, make sure to shift the focus to the topic, not yourself. The next, be yourself. The best way to get to know someone is to be authentically you. Allow yourself to be as authentic as well. When talking about your projects, gear the conversation towards sharing, not selling. Next, prep beforehand. It's always a good idea to have questions or topics prepped before you attend the event. It's also really nice that some events share the list of attendees. So you're able to look at who's, who's gonna be in attendance and see if there's anybody who you may wanna connect with. Next, bring a friend. It's always easier to get to know other people in groups. That way you can also build off each other. Next, be curious. People love talking about themselves. Ask lots of follow-up questions to whatever the conversation is at hand. And lastly, Offer to help. In an authentic manner, offer you how your expertise can help this person's initiative, business, or how you can connect them with someone else. When approaching networking from a selfless space, the connections formed tend to be a lot more genuine. Now that you've heard these tactics, as we go through today's presentation and discussion, think to yourself, how can you improve and what lessons can you learn from the experiences we are about to hear? Today, our panelists are Amanda Mountain. She is the president and CEO of Rocky Mountain PBS. And we also have Sachi Christine Kobayashi, director of development at WXPN. Thank you ladies so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Alrighty, so our first panelist today and the first case study that we'll hear is Sachi's. So Sachi, I will now give you a remote control of the presentation and you can go ahead and take it away. Uh, oh, let's just From current, current slide, there you go. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, um, Veronica. Uh, I was very flattered, but also kind of surprised when I was asked to speak on this subject. Um, because I think as, as an introvert, even though I think some people don't realize I am one, uh, I often don't consider this a strength, um, but especially when I finished my graduate degree and I was getting out into the workforce, uh, it's something I really thought about a lot and I was able to just sort of serendipitously come across a couple books um, that really inspired me and helped inform um, my approach to my early career networking. Um, so I'm happy to share that with you all today. So the first book was uh, Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg. Um, I think a lot of early career networking often involves looking for advice or help or mentorship. And this book ha is, has some wonderful advice specifically about mentorship. Um, so I do love this quote from her. I think particularly women, um, they often feel that like a mentor is something that's gonna somehow magically unlock their career. Uh, the reality though, is that all relationships, even mentoring relationships are reciprocal. And so it's really important to be respectful of the person's time, making sure that you open up with something that's very specific about what they do, um, maybe relates to something that you very specifically want to learn from them and not have it just be generic. 
um, small talk, especially if you're an introvert, can be challenging and it can also not be the best use of someone's time. I think offering to give something back to a mentee, that's one of the best pieces, pieces of advice I received from this book, is that even as the mentee, telling your mentor, I really hope that this can be a mutually beneficial relationship. Um, if there's anything I can ever help you with, uh, let me know. And that can sometimes feel, I think, a little bit daunting as a mentee, but sometimes it can be as simple as offering um, a younger perspective or a different perspective. I was um, officially hooked up with a mentor through a mentoring program um, that was much more senior than me and worked in underwriting. And I had no idea how I could possibly help her. Um, and she was giving me such wonderful guidance and mentorship. And we eventually came to a point where she needed to brainstorm um, an underwriting pitch for a campaign that was geared at a much younger demographic. And she ended up bouncing a bunch of ideas off of me because I was the sort of target demographic they were trying to reach. Um, and I understood the industry. So I think that's something you never know how you might be able to give back to your mentor and to make that meaningful for both parties. Uh, and I think, you know, a lot of times advice and mentorship comes in a lot of forms and it might just be a one-off call that you have with someone that ends up giving you the guidance that you need and it doesn't have to always be an official mentorship. And mentorship takes on many forms, including the fact that peers can mentor each other. And, um, especially through Lead In, I got to be part of a lot of women's networking groups where most of the women in my group were peers, and yet we were able to really support each other um, by peer mentoring. Another book that I came across pretty early in my career after grad school was Quiet by Susan Cain. Um, and this really helped me address some of my issues networking as an introvert. Um, I think I was so called, like concerned uh, with, oops, sorry, skipping around here a little bit. I was so uh, worried about cultivating this persona that was a networking persona and was like super extroverted um, that I ended up creating this sort of fake version of myself um, that was a stereotype of what I thought extroverts who were good at networking were like. And I didn't realize that it was annoyingly inauthentic. And it was also really exhausting for me. And I would get burnt out sometimes to the point of getting sick um, because I was pretending to be somebody I wasn't. And so this book really helped me identify the strengths that introverts have. And rather than trying to fix things I thought were wrong with me, really playing to my personal strengths when it comes to networking. And that involves a lot of things. It's really, I try to look for a deep, meaningful one-on-one -on -one conversation in a networking situation, rather than just working a room and trying to get as many business cards as possible. Um, I really like to leverage digital media. A lot of introverts actually tend to communicate better on highly mediated forms of, like email, LinkedIn. And so for me, I can often find it easier to, after a conference, add all the people that I wanted to network with on LinkedIn, follow up with a message and ask to have a one-on-one -on -one phone call with them. And that's gonna be a lot more um, authentic to myself. It's gonna be less stressful for me. I'm gonna be able to have the time to do the research that I, I need to do to have a meaningful, mutually beneficial conversation with them. Um, and that's much better for me than just trying to impress them with a five second elevator speech in person. And then I think it's also really important to take time to recharge. And if I know that I have a really big, important networking event that's happening later in the day at a conference, I may even skip a less important section of the conference to give myself to recharge. So I'll take my lunch and I'll go elsewhere. I'll go find a quiet place outside even if I can so that I can recharge by myself and bring my best self to the parts of the conference that I need to really show up for. Um, and then I think in terms of talking about the fact that all relationships that are, are, that are good relationships are mutually beneficial, when you sort of look at that in mass across a lot of people, what we're really doing is we're talking about building community. And this is something I'm deeply passionate about. It aligns with my personal values and I think wonderfully it aligns with having a career in public media because this is all that we're about. And so, you know, part of being a good steward within any community is to be an active listener and to ask thoughtful questions. It's to volunteer and give back. Um, it's to be authentic and connect with your passion. 
Uh, and that's something I think that we get to share a lot in public media too, is so many people who work in this industry are deeply passionate about what they do. And that's so inspiring to me. And when I'm able to connect with someone one-on-one -on -one in, about that kind of issue, that's something that actually recharges me even as an introvert. And then um, I think things that women generally tend to do better is to be vulnerable, empathetic, and um, you know, use our emotions as strengths. Because when we're bringing our whole authentic emotional selves to the table, um, we're able to even more deeply connect as, as community members. Um, so yeah, these are things that are really important to me. And by focusing on how these things are important to me, um, and I've also been able to then use them, I think, effectively to network. So, oops, I'm so sorry. Speaking of which, let's connect. Um, so I recently joined the Prado Board. That's the Public Radio As uh, Development Association. If you do work in development, either underwriting or fundraising, um, I do hope you join the listserv. There's amazing conversations that are happening on there and we're looking to explore other ways to broaden those conversations, even off the listserv. If you go to pradoweb.org, you'll be able to join. Uh, and then I've also recently started volunteering um, to help with the launch of the Public Media Development Professionals of Color Initiative. This is a new group that we just launched after PMD PMDMC last year with the help of Greater Public. We're going to have an official uh, Professionals of Color cohort at PMDMC in Atlanta this year. And to get the ball rolling and start to get the conversation going and figure out what issues are most important to people of color working in development and public media, we've started a Facebook group and a Google group. They're both private, so if you'd like to join, we'd love to have you. Just shoot me an email, k at xpn.org, or add me on LinkedIn, and I'd be happy to connect you with the group. So thank you so much, Veronica, and, and uh, everyone else for your time. Thank you so much, Sachi, for this wonderful presentation. We will now hear from Amanda Mountain. Amanda, I will now give you remote control of the presentation and you can take it away. Sounds good, thank you. Well, so much of what Sachi is saying is uh, really resonating with me and I hope with you. I am not um, an introvert per se, but I am at the lowest possible scale of extrovert. So I, sometimes I, I certainly feel like I get more energy from uh, time I have to recharge than I do from being with others, but um, I understand that balance very well firsthand. All right, let's see. I am just making sure I have control of the slide. So uh, a couple of things really um, guide my approach to networking and my philosophy towards it. Uh, one of them is that I am on that lower end of the extrovert scale. And so I try to find ways to feel more comfortable in situations where I might not normally. And typically that comes from giving myself a job. And in order to do that, I really need to understand what am I trying to accomplish? Oh, I'm not sure why that happened. Let me go back. Oh. <laughs> All right. All right. Bear with me. Technical difficulties. So I grew up a military brat. I um, moved around every one to two years uh, of my um, adolescence. And as a result, I very much feel like the new girl when I'm in really large, unfamiliar social situations. Um, for the first 10 years of my career, I really spent um, my time saying yes to everything. Any invitation that I got to meet new people, to go to a reception or a luncheon, I said yes to everything. And as a result, I, um, I got a little burned out, but then I also was able to better discern as I got a little further into my career, what do I want to accomplish with my networking? And so I do think that oftentimes that's the hardest question to answer is what do you want? Um, there are a lot of different reasons to network. Um, I personally have a three-year-old at home and I know we all have jobs with demands. And so I don't want to be gone nights and weekends unless it is explicitly helping me reach my personal or professional goals. And so asking yourself, what do you want and how can networking help you get it is a good first start. So a, a few examples of things that you might um, 
want to accomplish out of networking is uh, first and foremost to recognize that it really is all about relationships. So are you looking for a new job or do you want a promotion in your current organization? Are you looking to expand your network of friends or find a mentor? Or is networking really a part of your job because you're in the development profession, which I certainly am. And so networking helps you fundraise. Uh, there's all sorts of different reasons why you might want to network and reminding yourself that it is about those relationships and strengthening ones that you already have and making new ones that are tied to your goals uh, really helps decide what is going to be a valuable use of your time and what isn't. So setting specific goals will really help you do that and increase the likelihood that you get what you want out of networking. So uh, I do, because I feel uncomfortable in large situations sometimes, I like to do my research ahead of time because feeling prepared makes me feel more comfortable in situations where I might not normally feel comfortable. So um, once I get a sense of what I want, I tailor my networking goals um, to uh, really do my research. Um, if there is a promotion that I want or a new job that I want, I might do a little bit of research to identify, well, what people or organizations are connected to that goal and that would lead me to some networking opportunities that I want to prioritize with my time. Um, if you're looking for a new, if you're looking for a new job, you might start with some digital networking through LinkedIn like Sachi mentioned or other social sites and then you can attend some events where you know people from those organizations are going to be there so that when you're there, you can get a better understanding of how that organization works. You can meet some people that can help you gain more information into your goal and help you build your network of people who are all there to potentially help you um, achieve what you want. Um, if you want a promotion, attending happy hours or lunches with colleagues um, might be some different ways to think about networking, whereas very often it's easy to think of um, galas or receptions or big, huge luncheons as networking events. Networking is a lot of different things. It's really just um, how are you using uh, the opportunity to be with somebody in person to, to build or strengthen relationships. So that does include happy hours with some of your coworkers and all sorts of different things. Um, if you want a promotion, another way to think about networking might be volunteering for cross-departmental projects, which is yet another form of networking. Um, if you're fundraising, attending events presented by organizations where like-minded donors are most likely to be present might help you narrow your focus um, from the world of everything uh, that you could possibly go to. I also um, have found it tremendously helpful to understand when just to say no. Um, uh, and, and I have to do that a lot because I'm trying to protect my time, keep my energy focused on my priorities and reaching those goals, whether they're personal or professional. And so there really are never, there's never a shortage of any networking events and it can be really easy to feel guilty about saying no to any of them. Um, strategic networking really does require the discipline to do that uh, so they, and uh, if you don't say no, it does sometimes make it less likely that you can reach your goals because you are spreading yourself so thin that it's um, uh, hard to take on what's most likely to get you closer to what you want. And you definitely should say no when networking makes you feel uncomfortable or unsafe. I, I know um, in being in the development profession that oftentimes, unfortunately, there can be situations where a donor might invite you to something in their home or a colleague might invite you to a happy hour um, later at, at night. Though for whatever reason for, um, that you may feel uncomfortable, it's always okay to listen to your gut and to say no. Um, and I think that that is really important to remember because it's, it's unfortunately um, really easy to find ourselves in those situations and to somehow feel guilty about them instead of empowered to say no. Also say no to things that just aren't likely to help you reach your goals. Um, while sometimes you may find yourself in an event that you didn't think you were going to meet somebody at to help you reach your goal and you do, those things are still, I think, less common. And so um, really at the front end, looking at what is your plan to reach your goal? How can networking help you do it? And how do you say no to everything that doesn't fall within that scope um, and feeling good about it is important. And then also making sure that networking isn't getting in the way of some of your priorities, personally or professionally. And I mentioned for me, um, being a mom who is present is really important to me. That is a priority that oftentimes supersedes my, um, 
my ability to be everywhere all the time where I might want to be. So once you've done your research, you're at an event that's connected to your goals, what now? Um, I find it helpful to identify one to two people that I absolutely need to meet or talk to in advance before walking in that door. And frequently I like to look them up just so I know what they look like and can seek them out, particularly if I've never met them before. And that is the job that I give myself. And having that job makes me feel more comfortable being in that room where I might not know anyone. Um, also, I like to scan the room for anybody I already know to see if maybe they can um, help me make introductions to get closer to the people that I want to meet or just to have some friends um, around that where we can all kind of um, uh, feel more comfortable talking to each other, uh, you know, just building that um, cohort of colleagues is always helpful. If I don't know anybody, I, I sometimes will just do my job and then leave. So I'll look for those one to two people that I haven't met. I'll make sure I introduce myself. I will um, have the best conversation I can with them. And my goal is almost always to um, set the stage for a personal one-on-one -on -one meeting outside of that networking event. That's where I find the most valuable relationships are built is one-on-one. -on -one. So that's typically my goal. And, um, and I don't necessarily feel guilty about going into an event accomplishing my goal and then leaving. And if it only takes 15, 20 minutes to do that, so be it, I get more time with my kid at home. So I made um, a fair amount of mistakes over the years in networking and just wanted to share some. Um, try not to forget your business cards or your name tag. Those things are really helpful um, uh, in building those relationships and making sure that you can bridge them into one-on-one -on -one conversations afterwards. Uh, don't forget to ask for that one-on-one -on -one meeting. Um, sometimes it might not feel comfortable because you, you might feel like you're putting somebody on the spot, but if you do feel comfortable and someone's opened the door to an invitation, always make sure you, you walk through that door. Uh, don't forget to read the news. Uh, oftentimes, again, I will feel more comfortable just knowing what's going on that day because it very likely will come up in conversation at a networking event and you don't want to feel like you're unprepared for that. Um, don't wing it when it comes to introducing yourself. I do like to have a sense of who am I and how do I convey that when I'm introducing myself to someone who's never met me before. And so just getting comfortable with that is helpful. I don't always recite the same thing. Typically I don't, but just knowing how I'm defining myself and, and communicating that is important to me and makes me feel more comfortable. Uh, I, I, Veronica said it, so did Sachi. Don't think you have to be perfect. No one is. Just be real. People connect with realness, even, even when it's flawed. Uh, and try not to have more than one drink. Um, I, you know, all the time we see, um, we see people, I've made that mistake, just getting a little too comfortable at a networking event and then not having, um, not having a command of the situation. Uh, so I like to make sure I don't fall into that. And this is how to get in touch with me. You can reach me on LinkedIn or always reach out to me via email. Um, any questions we don't get a chance to answer today, I welcome you reaching out and I look forward to helping you achieve your goals. Thank you so much, Amanda, for this fantastic presentation. Both you ladies have been fantastic. Now, what we're going to do is talk to you guys. So anybody who wants to ask some questions to our wonderful panel. Please make sure to use that Q&A function within the webinar platform to ask your questions. Um, Katie, do we have any questions so far? Uh, yeah, we have a few. Uh, some are submitted ahead of time. Um, this first one says, I have issues with small talk and breaking the ice when walking up to someone. I'm also more of a listener when first meeting someone. So how do I make it so I'm more engaged in the conversation? I try to think of questions to ask, but I'm shy, so those questions don't come easily. What do you guys think? What, what is the one thing that, for instance, first of all, do you guys like small talk? Um, I, I'll go first. Uh, I hate small talk. I, I almost never make small talk. <laughs> Uh, I think I loved Amanda's point about she picks a couple people in advance she wants to talk to. I think I often do that as well. And I have something specific I want to talk to them about. So instead of um, just sliding up to them and asking them how the weather is, I'm far more likely to be like, hi, my name is Sachi. I'm the director of development about WXPN. I love what you're doing at XYZ station. And I'd love to talk with you about that more. 
Um, and then a lot of times they don't want to make small talk at that point either. Like they, the people will pick up fairly quickly that that's like a, needs to be a more lengthy one-on-one -on -one conversation. And they'll either make time for you at that networking event, or it's really easy to follow up with them afterwards. Um, especially if you're having trouble thinking of questions in the moment, you know, after you've talked with them, follow up with them via email or LinkedIn and be like, I loved what you had to say about X, Y, Z. I've been thinking about that conversation we had and here's some questions that I had that came up from it. Um, and so you don't have, I don't think you have to ask questions in the moment per se either. Mm -hmm. Amanda, what are your thoughts? Yeah, just to build on, on what Sachi said, I do think it's really, really important that in the course of a conversation, if you um, say you're going to do something, it's really important to follow up and do that. So if you say, oh, hey, or if you talk about a book and you follow up with, um, with them for a link to that book, all those things help build relationship and help, help show someone that you're, you're listening, which is really, really important to relationship building. Um, in terms of small talk, I... It depends on what the small talk is like my go to question if I don't have a specific thing I need or want to talk about is to ask somebody, you know, what are you most passionate about right now? Is, is there a project or um, is there something that you're doing at work that's that you're most passionate about? And usually that triggers a really interesting and fun conversation that I'm not sure what and I never really know what to expect, but that's kind of my my go-to question that helps me uh, just learn more usually about something I don't really know that much about and certainly learn more about the person I'm talking to. Those um, are great tips. Katie, do we have anything else? Or oh, Sasha, you were going to say something. Yeah, no, I was going to say uh, that reminded me, actually, my go-to question is what's the biggest challenge you're trying to address right now? And, um, and then I look for ways that I can be helpful to them. And that's one of the number one ways that somebody will remember you. <laughs> We what I like, of, what I like okay. to ask sometimes, if if the conversation is going to that point, this is beyond already starting the conversation. Is what are you passionate about? What it, what are you looking or seeking to accomplish? That might be a little too deep for some people, but I do like to get into those questions because oftentimes you'll be able to see people's true essence by asking that. So it's really exciting when having a conversation that revolves around people's passions as well. Um, Katie, do we have any other questions? We do, we have a couple, and we also have some follow-ups to the small talk conversation. Perfect. Um, the first thing is a, a suggestion of a couple other kind of like icebreakers, uh, specifically in public media, which include uh, how are you handling impeachment coverage or some other like newsy event that's happening now, or um, any great pledge drive strategies you've used recently. So kind of breaking the ice that way, suggested by someone. Um, and then somebody else had another kind of question or comment that I really relate to, so I'm curious to see what you think about this. Um, she says, I find the most difficult part of small talk and networking at events is that uh, I find the hardest part is breaking into the conversation. So it's hard when you want to talk to someone and they're in a conversation to avoid being a creepy lurker, but kind of like waiting to the side to wait for them to break away. Do you have advice on that? I do feel like very like spatially awkward when I network as well. So I'm curious about what you have to say to that. Amanda, you're smiling. What, what are you thinking? <laughs> no, I wish I had the answer to that. I oftentimes feel like the creepy lurker and it's awful. I hate that feeling. Um, I'm not sure I know how to do that particularly well, though oftentimes when you're lurking, you see other people break into conversations and feel more comfortable doing it. And, um, and so what I have seen um, is that you can break into a conversation just by saying, excuse me, and asking a question. And typically the reaction is not one of insults or, um, uh, so sometimes it's just about feeling comfortable breaking in and, um, and not feeling so shy that you end up standing on the, on the sidelines for five, 10 minutes, which I have been in the situation of doing, unfortunately. <laughs> Sachi, what about you? Um, maybe less so for uh, in public media networking, but with donor events, that's why I think it's so important to be by the door. And your best option is to catch them coming in or catch them leaving. And um, they're far less likely to be hanging out by the door talking to someone. And so then you don't have to try to break in as awkwardly, um, especially if you are able to greet them when you walk in and so you introduce yourself as they're walking in and then when they're leaving, um, try to grab a couple minutes of their time to actually have a conversation with them. I've also heard, um, and people may have mixed emotions about this, if there's uh, standing tables, so tall tables, 
claiming one and usually people will gravitate towards you what are you guys thinking about that like choosing a section within the room and sticking to it I, mean, I think that can certainly help if you're feeling really uncomfortable i also think that it makes it less likely that you're going to um, talk to the people that you need and want to talk to you because they may or may not be coming to you. So being prepared to, to go to them is something I do think is, is critical in making sure you accomplish your goals for whatever that networking event are. Yes. Katie, do we have anything else? Any other question? Yeah, we have a couple more. Uh, the first one also kind of deals with like some awkwardness of like being brought into a conversation. Uh, so how do you deal with getting pulled into networking conversations that you're not prepared for by like senior coworkers or the CEO? And then how do you excuse yourself after being left stranded talking to someone after they have exited? Cool. So let's tackle the first section of that question. Sachi, what are you thinking? Um, interesting. That's an interesting one. Um, I think it's a, it really depends on what the motivation of the senior manager is. Mm -hmm. uh, and if, if your need, if your goal is to support them or if they're just trying to uh, use you to get out of the conversation. Um, but I do like, Amanda said she likes to give herself a job. I totally agree. I, I have to have a job when doing events and events is probably the, the type of uh, work that I have the most experience in because I started putting on punk rock shows at my church when I was 15. And um, so I, I also like volunteering for this reason, because even if I didn't organize the event, once I go into an event, I can volunteer to fill almost any role at an event. And that's always one of the best reasons to leave a conversation is because you have to do something. Mm -hmm. What about you, Amanda? Yeah, I think it's always okay if you're unprepared in a, for a conversation to um, try to request that you follow back up, um, you know, oh, I hadn't thought about that. I'd love to think about it and then pivot the conversation to something that might be more in line with what your goals are. If it's someone who is in kind of a senior position, there's always, it's always an opportunity when you engage with them to stand out, to help um, plant the seeds for things that you care about, you want to accomplish. And so pivoting and uh, the conversation into something like that, I think is always doable and expected really um, in a lot of instances. And so feeling comfortable doing that is important. Uh, in terms of extracting yourself for conversa from conversations that you're you, you feel have kind of played their, themselves out to their logical conclusion. I always think that it's okay to say, oh, hey, can I get you a drink at the bar? Or, oh, I am, please excuse me, I've got to speak to this person um, before they get uh, engaged in some other conversations. Or, you know, just having a couple of, again, jobs to speak to that are, you know, um, justifiable reasons to break away from a conversation at any point uh, helps. That way you're not kind of scrambling and and it comes across, of course, when you are uh, to that other person and then they feel like you're just trying to avoid them, which of course you are, but you don't want them to know. Right, right. It's always that fine line between being kind, but also, hey, I have this goal in this event. I wanna make sure to talk to someone, but also of course, like you guys are embodying politeness and making sure that people feel authentic in that connection while also, hey, I'll, I'll be back in a second or let's let's continue this offline or online if that's the word um but yeah this that's a great point amanda and sachi um anything else katie sorry sorry uh, yeah I, yeah a couple oh, sachi, you said oh yeah yeah um yeah i think the other thing is to really listen to your emotion like mm -hmm. if you're feeling awkward there's probably a reason and embracing like, what am I actually scared of? Is that a legitimate fear? If so, it doesn't matter how awkward things are going to be. If I leave, I should leave. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, if you, are, if you identify the fear that's causing you to feel awkward as maybe not being as legitimate or pressing, um, addressing that and sort of, I think also embracing it and realizing that most people feel somewhat awkward while networking and awkwardness is not inherently bad. Sometimes it's a social cue. I think to the lurking thing, I don't, I know it's awkward to lurk and wait to try to get someone's attention, but that lurking is actually a, a way to communicate that you want someone's attention. And if that's the only way 
to get in with talking to them and it's that important to your goals you've set for the meeting or for the networking event to, to meet with them, then I, I would set my the awkward feelings aside and lurk away. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it's, it's more important to have that objective in mind. Like you said, Asachi, if you need to talk to someone at that event, take a second to put your best looking face forward and really look that you want to talk to that person. Because oftentimes, like you said, Sachi, someone will be like, oh, hi, or did you have anything to say? Or they'll, they'll really grab on the vibe as well. Katie? Uh, yeah, we have a couple more kind of more pieces of advice about uh, networking and then another question after that. Um, so let's see, we have people suggesting that um, one thing that they love doing is asking others if they're looking forward to meeting anyone in particular at the conference or at the event, and then they can kind of become the connector between a new friend with a known entity mm -hmm. and that person remembers them as the connector. So like not doing the direct networking as much as kind of connecting two parties together. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other piece of advice was um, seeking people who are the introverts in the corners and having kind of a few work questions that are ready for them uh, to help get the conversation started. And this person says that they've found a few good contacts that way as well. So kind of like going out into the perimeter. Um, and then the next question we had is uh, if you all have any recommendations for how to network with people who are outside of your geographic location in particular. So if you're trying to break into a new market but don't have any connections in the market, um, what would you recommend? That's an exciting question. Uh, Amanda, do you have anything for that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's okay to email somebody directly once you've done your research and you understand the kind of conversation you want to have. If it's about just general relocation or if it's about job placement, um, really identifying what kinds of um, groups do you already belong in and do those groups exist in another state or another region? And if they do, I think it's always, um, uh, typically always acceptable for you to just reach out directly and say, hey, I'm a member of this organization in my state. Uh, I'd love to find out a little bit more about how this group works in this other state or, oh, we all work in public media. I work in Wisconsin. I'd like to call you in Colorado to find out more about job opportunities as I'm planning a move. Um, you know, just figuring out where are those groups that you belong to and reaching out is always acceptable, whether it's through email or LinkedIn. I don't know about other people, but I don't necessarily prefer professional outreach through um, social media channels other than LinkedIn because I just candidly don't stay on top of it. I don't look at those channels in that way. And it's more, it, it, it sometimes feels more like an intrusion, but if it's through LinkedIn or through email, those are things, those are places where I expect to be um, engaged professionally. Sashi, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, one thing that I do that's very nerdy and very specific to public media is that um, I love touring other stations. So when I'm on vacation in another area, I will cold reach out to someone there if I don't know anybody in specifically and I'll ask, I'll introduce myself and ask for a station tour and offer to share um, any updates about what we're doing in fundraising so that it is a little more mutually beneficial. And then I think sometimes when you're networking at a conference, it's not, it doesn't have to be about specific people. I, I've gone to conferences and been like, I specifically wanna to talk to someone from a station in Vermont and I'll, be, I'll do some research on the station as a whole. And then I'm looking for anybody who works at that station. And I think that can be sufficient enough research too. It doesn't have to be a specific person. It can be a specific organization from a specific region that you wanna to talk to. Yeah, I completely agree. One thing that I've learned in just reaching out to folks and attending events, one some, something that's really interesting is when cold emailing or cold messaging through LinkedIn through those platforms, more likely than not, people will reply. It's it's rare when people don't reply. They'll at least say something where it's like hi or thanks for connecting. It does not have to be to the point of of having to get something out of it. But at the same time, getting in the mindset of it's okay to cold email, it's okay to cold connect with someone just because you're trying to learn 
a new community or dive into a new community, that's totally fine. And you're doing it from an authentic place and people will see that. So don't, I would like to pr persuade all of our folks here in our audience to take that leap if you have to. And it's not as scary as it seems. And the worst that could happen is someone doesn't reply and then you move on to the next person. Katie, do we have any more questions? We have a couple more. Cool. Um, let's see, in terms of strengthening a new professional connection, what do you do to follow up with people? Cool. Sachi, what are you thinking? I, I follow up, follow up, follow up. I know Amanda's been saying it too, but it's, it's so mm -hmm. true. And the, the timeliness of it matters so much. Like when I come back from a conference, even though I might be exhausted and I might be behind on emails for my day-to-day -day job, the first thing I do is I start adding people on LinkedIn. If there was specific questions I had, or if I promised to send them a link to an article, I do that immediately. Mm -hmm. um, if, and I, I, yeah, I think that that sort of responsiveness, the, um, one of the things I've heard recently at a professional development thing was that trust is um, respect and uh, consistency over time. And so if you, uh, if, if you really wanna build trust with someone, um, which I think is essential for having a good, deep networking relationship. Uh, that consistency is, is so key. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my thoughts on that. You're, you're right on the dot, Sachi. Trust, to build trust, you need to also, like for instance, whatever mindset you have, it needs to be, with, it has to have its corresponding action. So for instance, if you tell someone, hey, I will follow up with you, like as we go to events, if you say someone, I will follow up with you, actually shooting that person an email and following up, that shows that you stand by your word and people are more willing to then move on to a trusting friendship or relationship in that regard. Um, Amanda, what are your thoughts? Well, I think first, uh, first things first is that most, uh, you, we've all experienced it, but I'm always shocked by how few people actually do that. Mm -hmm. And so just by the nature of following up in any regard, you're going to stand out from most people because I would say it's the mi minority that really listen thoughtfully in a conversation, pick up on things that might be of interest, and then follow up with a link to an article or, you know, on, on, I'll tell a story about an event that I went to that was an opening at an art gallery. This was a situation where I was there to demonstrate respect for a partner, but I didn't have um, um, uh, anyone outside of the head of that particular organization in mind in terms of who I needed to meet and, and talk to while I was there. I did end up talking to somebody who was kind of off in the corner. I think Sachi made that point or someone made that point earlier about looking for people who might feel uncomfortable and help them feel uh, more so. And um, and he, he ended up mentioning a book that he liked and we were talking a little bit about that. And then afterwards, I sent that book to him along with a little handwritten note. And I didn't do any research on this person. I wasn't expecting to meet this person. Um, but it, it, it turns out this person was a donor of the organization that I was at. And this person ultimately ended up giving our group um, a six figure gift. So sometimes that um, personal touch will absolutely distinguish you from others. And, and, I, and I do think it's just absolutely critical, any chance you can follow up, that you can demonstrate that you were listening during the course of the conversation is again, rare and appreciated. That's a great tip, Amanda. Sending someone a book and a handwritten note. I think the value of a handwritten note, people underestimate that value, especially, now with the digital era, but it, it speaks volumes. And being, being able to show that you listened in that regard with the book and the handwritten note, even like you mentioned, you did not know the background of this person, but then it ended up being a, a wonderful partnership that was developed. Um, Katie, is there anything else? Uh, I think we've touched on mostly everything. Um, Sachi and Amanda, do you have any closing thoughts or anything else you want to add on?
I'll go first since I'm sure Sachi has something really um, uh, amazing to say and I don't want to follow that. But I, I will just say that I think it's really important to recognize that the people you meet are responsible in large part for supporting your success. And so um, looking at networking as an opportunity to um, either uh, you know, recognize that there are so many people around that want to help participate in your success or to participate in helping someone else be successful as a way to give back um, can sometimes just help give, give networking a totally different paradigm where it's less intimidating and it's really more about how can you participate in creating a sense of belonging um, for yourself, for others, and, and recognizing how powerful that can be. Um, and then, of course, just always the benefit of asking yourself, what do I want and not being um, uh, not feeling guilty about pursuing it uh, and saying no to things that are not necessarily going to help you um, achieve that. Uh, that I ha that's what I was a lot of pressure. Amanda, but um, uh, yeah, I think, you know. Um, I'm just internally grateful for spaces like this, uh, the public media women in leadership space and the space that we're trying to create with um, the public media development professionals of color group, um, because those spaces, I think, inherently come with a higher level of um, safety for being emotionally vulnerable and for being authentic. And when you have the space to practice that with more like-minded people, it gets easier to do it in situations where you might be trying to meet, connect with people that are not as like-minded. Um, so I'm very grateful for this space and I hope people are taking um, the most of this and also giving the most back to it. If you are not volunteering with one of our amazing public media professional groups, um, don't hesitate to jump right in. Great way to learn and meet new people. Um, so that's, I think that's my biggest takeaway is that I'm really grateful for the public media community in general, because as Veronica pointed out, they tend to be highly responsive. You can cold email almost anybody in public media and they're probably going to respond, but also these, these specific spaces. Thank you so much, Sachi and Amanda, for this wonderful conversation. We're already getting some comments of people saying thank you for having this session. So I'm so excited that we were able to get a little bit of your time today to have this conversation. I do want to note to, piggy up, to piggyback off what Sachi just mentioned, on Wednesday, please check your emails and PMWL's various platforms as we will have a promotion about volunteer opportunities. So if you want to connect with more folks within the, our community, PMWL, if you want to learn new skills, make sure to stay on the lookout for that. Um, Katie, I'll hand it off back to you. Sure, thanks. Um, so thanks again, just echoing uh, thank you to our amazing panelists and to our audience for joining us for this candid conversation. Um, be sure to visit our website, publicmediawomeninleadership.org, to find out what's in store for our advanced webinar series in 2020. And as always, we'll be posting the recording of this webinar to our website. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.